Greetings, friends. And after today, maybe one more enemy. <laughs> so, today I had an interview scheduled with another author, the author of Elphistra the Sorceress, book two of the Wand Chronicles, a gentleman by the name of Michael Ross. Uh, unfortunately, the interview was not taking place when I informed Michael that I had some very serious uh, criticisms and critiques of his work. He elected to bow out of the interview, and so uh, he is not here today, but that does not mean he gets off scot-free. On the one hand, I could have just said, well, that was a terrible read and a waste of my time and let it go. But on the other hand, studying what not to do is valuable as an author. It's valuable as anyone who writes for any reason. And I'm sorry to inform the author, but this book is a case study in what not to do on many many levels. There is also, of course, the issue of professional pride. I take my writing very seriously. I'm sure many other indie authors take their writing very seriously. And when people bring stuff like this to market, it gives independent writers who self-publish a bad name. It reinforces the old tired stereotype that if it's self-published, it's not good that you have to make it through the gatekeepers at the big five to prove you're a good writer. Authors like Jenna Moresi disprove that wholly. She's an indie author. She's entirely self-published. Her work is amazing. And authors like Michael Ross reinforce that stereotype with iron bars with Elfie's for the Sorceress. So I'm going to try to be professional and impartial, but if a little bit of personal ire slips into my dialect and tone that's why so without further to do we are going to start attacking these in a very structured list like manner one by one and we're going to go through the problems and there's going to be some brief discussion on the ones that i can remember specific examples for and yeah let's do it so the first issue the editing oh sweet god the editing <laughs> it, it, it goes without saying that if you want your book to be taken seriously to be well received it needs to be polished it needs to be well edited it needs to be understandable clear concise and well written i don't know what the editor was thinking i don't know what was going on with that and in fact, I contacted the editing company that is listed in the book's acknowledgments because I wanted to get a statement from them because the editing is so bad, I wanted to give them a chance to defend themselves. Here's what they had to say. All right, guys, so this is just a quick look at a live chat I had with an agent regarding this book. This is the website that uh, did the edit. I will uh, provide a link in the description so you can go check out the website yourself. So this is the transcript. You can slow it down. I'm not going to read it. Be Actually, you know what? No, let's have a, let's have some fun. I'm going to read it. So, I say a book titled Elfistra the Sorceress went through your editing company. The book is terrible. Reads like a 5-year-old wrote it. Can you explain that? The agent. I'm not sure if I can because I didn't write the book. And I reply but your company edited it. Grammar, punctuation, spelling, syntax are all part of, and I repeat the word of accidentally, of, of a proper edit. There are entire sections of dialogue with no quote marks, which is true. I'm just investigating because I am a professional reviewer and I am trying to see what went wrong. And then... <laughs> uh, he says, and then he sends like a little copy paste thing that says you've reached live chat for firstedit.com. This channel is provided to answer client services. And I say, okay, who do I take this issue to? I'm Karen and I want a manager. <laughs> I'm just having fun with it at this point. And he says, you may coordinate that with the author. And, um, I inform him that me and him had a scheduled interview that, uh, did not take place because of these issues that I'm highlighting. 
And uh, he says, you can leave your review. And I say, uh, you know, oh, God. Uh, just, yeah, this whole thing. You Like I said, you can read it on the screen. But, you know, he basically says, hey, man, you can, you can leave your review wherever books are sold. And I'm like, all right, man, I will. Have a blessed day. <laughs> and he's like, thank you, sir. I will. Oh, God. <laughs> that poor agent. I can be a dick sometimes. <laughs> I also sent them a follow-up email to give them one more chance to fully explain themselves, to maybe give me a more uh, more refined, thought-out statement. They never got back to me via email. So, I don't know what the story is on that editing. All I can tell you is the editing job that the book received was garbage. If I got that back from an editor, I would say... This is this is a first edit, right? I, I'm getting another I'm getting another edit, right? Or my money back, or both? <laughs> it's bad. And I want to preface this whole thing by saying I am not an English major. I didn't go to college. I make no secret about that. I'm just a guy who speaks native English and tries to use language masterfully because when you use language masterfully, you're an effective communicator, and that's just good for so many reasons it's it goes without saying being an effective communicator is a valuable skill and is a skill i try to cultivate within myself and i encourage other people to cultivate it so i pay attention to the rules of syntax and grammar and punctuation this editor does not one of the first things that struck me early on was i saw parentheses inside of dialogue parentheses inside of quotes I'm sure if you know anything about the English language and how to write it, you know why that's improper. But uh, I'm not going to go into an in-depth ex explanation because I, while I have an intrinsic understanding of why it's improper, it's hard to explain and I don't particularly feel a need to give an English lecture. We're critiquing a book, not giving a lesson on proper use of punctuation. So... Yeah, you don't put parentheses inside quote marks, and the editor should know that. The author should know that, as a matter of fact. 1.2. Making sure all of your speech is inside quotes, and none of your narrative is. In multiple sections, there's either a section of dialogue that doesn't have one of the quotes on either end. There's entire paragraphs where it's a section of dialogue and then a little bit of narrative, and then more dialogue, and the entire paragraph is in quotes. There's sections where <laughs> it's actually reversed, and what's clearly character dialogue doesn't have quotes, and narrative has quotes. The punctuation around the quotation marks in this book, I, it doesn't even look like a child did it, because my five-year-old niece, who struggles with language, would do a better job than this. She understands the proper use of punctuation well enough to put the stuff in quotes that needs to be. 1.3. Not stopping our flow of text every two or three words with a comma. Get the point? 1.4. Making sure we consistently spell our characters' names the same. I finished this book. I'll admit I heavily skimmed the last hundred or so pages because I just couldn't take the torture anymore. But I did finish the book. And I do not know if Alana's name is spelled A-L-L-A-N-A -L -L -A or A-L-A-N-A-A. -A -A -A. I cannot imagine misspelling a character's name multiple times throughout a book and leaving it there all the way through the editing process, all the way through the beta reading process, and publishing it that way. My protagonists would haunt me in my nightmares. Second point. The terrible grasp of syntax in the prose. Again, I'm not an English major. I'm just a guy who has a good command of language from being raised to speak English, having a mother and father who both were college educated, and sought out to give their kids a good grasp of language. 
the use of syntax or the more more accurately the lack of use of proper syntax in the prose is wretched it's sad and again i'm not i'm trying i'm not saying that to be mean or spiteful i'm saying this as a legitimate critique the syntax is non-existent it doesn't make sense half the time you read a sentence and you have to reread it and then read the paragraph you have to read ahead in the paragraph then go back and read the sentence again to figure out what he was saying i can't explain syntax well enough to establish it on my own and so i'm going to give you a clip of me reading the definition of syntax from the dictionary to fully establish what syntax is. The arrangement of words and phrases to create well-formed sentences in a language. A set of rules for an analysis of the syntax of a language, the branch of linguistics that deals with syntax. In linguistics, syntax is the set of rules, principles, and processes that govern the structure of a sentence in a given language, usually including word order. The term syntax is also used to refer to the study of such principles and processes. So, so we're all on the same page. That's what I mean when I say syntax. Point 2.1. The narrative can't seem to decide whether it's omniscient narration in multiple point of view or first person narration. There's multiple points in the narrative where it seems like it's being written or being told from the perspective of the main protagonist, Hugo. But there's also multiple points in the book where we jump to other perspectives, including the villain's perspective, including um, a side character's perspective. And you can't have your narrative jump from perspective to perspective to perspective and have it be impersonal on some of the perspectives, but personal on some of the other ones. You need your writing style to be consistent so there's a sense of immersion. If you constantly jerk your writing style around from one style to another in the same book, it's jarring and not in a good way, at least not most of the time. I'm sure if everything else was on point and you were doing it for the purpose of making each character whose perspective you were following feel unique, you could do that. I'm not saying it can't be done, but it's not pulled off here. And the problem is that the entire time it feels like we're being told this story around a campfire by a senile storyteller. So yeah, the, the use of syntax and language in the narrative is third point the storytelling elements including but not limited to pacing world building character development and the rise and fall of action are all poorly and lazily executed first of all the world building three point three point one in this story, he establishes that we go to an alternate dimension and we're on an alternate planet. It's not Earth. It's a, in this dimension, Earth never formed for some reason. So we're on this planet called Lenakia. And we're on this planet that is supposedly so huge that if you smushed Earth flat and put it on the surface of Lenakia, it would be a small dot in comparison to the rest of the planet. And our human protagonists walk around on this planet without issue. Now, I will grant that it's established that in Lenakia there's a slightly different set of physics. And okay, I can live with that. This is science fiction. Alternate dimension. Slightly altered physics. Alright. But gravity still has to work on some level. We see by how nature behaves in this in this other dimension we'll just call it Lenakia that's the name of the planet we'll just say it's the name of the, uh, name of the dimension too we know gravity functions so I really have trouble buying 
that humans would be anything other than red goo on the ground on a planet that massive. A planet that massive, I mean, the gravity, it would be five or six or seven times greater than Earth's gravity. Your bones would be dust. If you, you know, if you're writing fantasy, you can do pretty much whatever the hell you want. If you're writing science fiction, you got to be a little bit more grounded in physics. And this book tries to be science fiction. Point three, point two, continuing on with the world building. 40 pages in, and the most unrealistic thing about this book after we've introduced elves and a magic system and an interdimensional rift... The most unreliable and unrealistic thing is the condition Earth is supposedly in. There was a third world war, uh, the year is 2080, and there was a third world war, and climate change, and all this stuff, and both the ice caps have melted, 90% of the land mass is underwater, bees have gone extinct, and, and this and that and the other, and the fossil fuel reserves are gone. It's 2020 right now. There is absolutely no evidence that absolutely strictly makes it clear that in 60 years the world's going to be underwater there's no evidence that the bees are going to be extinct and there's definitely no evidence that the fossil fuel reserves are going to go away i've seen scientific estimates that say we could have fossil fuel reserves indefinitely that humans might literally never run out of fossil fuel reserves because by the time we were getting close in many many hundreds of years our renewable technology would have been perfected. So the idea that in 60 years we run out of fossil fuel reserves, I'm sorry, I'm not buying it. If, if the book was set 500 years in the future, yeah, okay. By then, ice caps melted, fossil fuel reserves gone, I could buy that. 60 years? Come on, come on, man. You're, 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 you're writing in science fiction. We gotta be a little more reasonable. These things take time. You don't burn through many, many hundreds of billions of metric tons of fossil fuel in 60 years. Doesn't, doesn't work like that. 3.3. <laughs> and this one is more about character building and character development. In the beginning of the book, the protagonist has two friends die. He's dragged through an interdimensional portal, kidnapped to a dimension he's never been to before by a race of elves. And he is immediately thrust into a conversation with one of these elves. And he's just the most cool-headed and collected and chill about the whole thing. And I'm sorry, I don't care if your protagonist is a stoic. I don't care if your protagonist is a sociopath. He's gonna have more of a reaction to an alien race kidnapping him than what our protagonist Hugo had in this book. It's entirely unbelievable. It's entirely fake. And it feels like... It feels like a robot, not a human, when I read Hugo's reaction to everything, honestly. It feels like an AI trying to think about how a human would react to that situation and not doing a very good job. 3.4 back to world building the elf family structure that we're given in this book makes absolutely no damn sense he establishes that his males are hermaphrodites and the females have evolved to become sterile first of all no species that evolved sexual reproduction would then continue to evolve away from cross-sex sexual reproduction because it's too efficient at recombining DNA to spur new genetic variation. It's one of the best methods of species continuation that the biosphere has to offer. That's why almost every species on the planet engages in it. Asexual reproduction is, unless you go to the world of bacteria, it is not the norm. Sexual reproduction is the dominant method of continuing a species for a reason, because biologically speaking, it's very effective. We have a species which has a genetic evolutionary path that makes no sense, 
And further furthering on in that theme, we have family units of two sterile females with one hermaphrodite male. So where does the male where, where does he where does he go to conceive a kid? It would make sense if we had a species like this with sterile females and males that did all the sexual reproducing. It would make sense to have a female in the family unit to contribute towards household upkeep, raising the child, blah, 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 and have two males that, rate, that conceived and raised the kids. But two sterile females who do not contribute to the creation of the kid at all, and one hermaphrodite male... Do I do I really need to explain why that doesn't make sense? Like does do, like really? Three point five, plot issue. I don't know if you've ever seen the movie The Room. It's a cult classic because, like this book, it's a case study in what not to do, and it's got many famous scenes in it, like the "You're tearing me apart, Lisa." Yeah, that meme, that's from the movie The Room. Go check it out. It's amazing. <laughs> in that movie, one of the things that we see is an absolute no-no in storytelling in general, no matter what format the storytelling is taking place, is that you do not dangle plot threads out and let them float into the ether never to be picked up on again. He does that in this book. We have several plot threads, and the main one that sticks in my head is there was an attack on the protagonist and who would become his girlfriend later, and it didn't go anywhere. It had it outside of the outside of the attack happening, it had absolutely no relevance on the story. It didn't impact character development. It only gave us a very slight insight into the way things are done in this Lanakian dimension. And the whole thing was just so ham-handed and out of place. It felt like I was reading something that belonged in another story. You could delete the entire scene, and it wouldn't impact the story at all. And I mean that wholeheartedly. 3.6. 3.6. You do not show the after effects of an event and begin resolving that event and then flash back to write out the event. Unless something happened in the event that was not what we were led to believe and so we have to see the event unfold so we have a better picture and it's ne- and it's relevant to the narrative. <sighs> this guy showed us that something was stolen, a magical wand, and we see the resolution, we see the guy going to retrieve it after its theft, and then he goes back and writes out the heist. And just like the last thing I mentioned, the arena and the attack there, you could remove the entire heist, and it wouldn't affect the book at all. In fact, it would make it better. In regards to that heist, point 3.8... They go to steal this wand because it's the most powerful magical artifact in the Lanakian dimension. It's basically the sum total of America's nuclear stockpile in terms of its raw power. At least that's how it's described by me. That I'm taking what he said and paraphrasing. And all the defense this magical wand gets is two guards outside the facility it's held in, which is a magical tree, two wolves on chains. Yeah, they're chained up, so not sure how much of a threat they're really supposed to be. And a hot river. And I'm not sure if it's acid or what. They kick a pebble in and the pebble burns, but then there's something swimming around in the river, so... Not sure how a rock burns and a living creature doesn't, but okay, magic I guess. But oh wait, there's a magical portal on the floor, and if we know the word, the magical portal will just zip us across the river. But how could we possibly know the word? Oh wait, literally every citizen in this entire dimension knows the magical word to activate these portals. There's no special word for this portal, it's just the same word they use for all their magical portals, to travel any which way they want to go. 
How would a villain ever, ever get access to that word? And then they zip across this flaming river, and the wand is just there. In a, in a box, on a display case, right out in the open to grab. And then they run out, and the wolves' chains are magical and degrade after they've been tugged on, so the wolves are now chasing them. So the sum total of this place's defenses are two guards, two restrained, then unrestrained wolves, and a river you can easily cross. Do I need to explain why a hyper-advanced race of magical elves would maybe give their most precious magical artifact a little more security than that. Just just a smidge. Like, you know, maybe a full regiment of armed guards and trained wolves that were not on chains and maybe a portal to cross the river that there's a very specific key phrase to that only the guards, or better yet, only the queen and the head sorceress of the empire know. I actually skipped a point, 3.7, but we're going back to it because it's important. When they're fleeing from this heist, and the wolves are chasing them after their chains magically degrade away, they shouldn't have had chains on in the first place. Why would you chain up your security system? They're running from these wolves, and the author stops mid wolf lunge the wolf is lunging at the guy carrying the staff and the author stops to give us an unrelated story about an unrelated event years prior i'm not kidding he really stops for a page to tell us about an unrelated event the hamstringing of any sense of urgency or action is it's almost deliberate it's almost like it, that's exactly what he wanted to do, was completely destroy any sense of urgency or action or thrill. And uh, if that is what he was going for, congratulations, you did it masterfully. Couldn't have done it better. 3.9. The author completely ignores his own world building, at least in one very important instance. We have these devices called HCs that go behind your ear. They're implanted at birth. It's mandatory. Everyone gets them. That's important. It's described in the book that everyone who has these things has their life recorded. All the images and information and sounds you take in are transported via this thing that's implanted in your skull to a data center where it's all processed. It's described that violent crime is practically non-existent. The violent crime that does take place is always completely prosecuted. They're working on an algorithm to predict behavior so that they apprehend people before they commit crimes. It's a very psychopath-esque idea. I don't know um, which came first, the anime or this guy's idea for these little things, but I digest. Yes, I know the word is digress. It's a reference. And so, later on in the book, after we've already established that we have these little devices behind your ear that capture everything you say, do, and see, we have a murder with three people at the scene. The victim, the murderer, and a witness. And then we have a murder trial where the wrong person stands accused. Do I need to explain further why that is the most moronic thing I've ever had to report to you? We have three points of view being recorded, and the author does not provide any explanation why that footage wouldn't have been recorded by their HCs. It wasn't a lead-lined room, so the images couldn't be transmitted. There wasn't an EMP disabling their HCs. No, nothing. Their HCs were up and working. This murder was caught from three perspectives, and on the word of... A fat bastard who no one likes and everyone knows is a crooked asshole, the wrong guy gets accused for the murder and goes to trial for it. Kind of forgot about your own world building, didn't you there, buddy? 3.10, further issue with the world. So it's described in the book that we have no fossil fuel, there's no nuclear, there's no solar, there's no wind, all conventional ways of creating electricity in mass for commercial use are gone but we regularly see regularly see the use of electronic equipment at the trial there's t 
TV screens to display video footage. There's security cameras in the mansion. That's how the protagonist gets exonerated. There was security footage. And, you know, the whole time you're sitting there wondering, wait, so where's the electricity power and all this equipment coming from? 3.11. He says all the bees are gone and humans have created alternate technology to replace the function of the bees. Sir, if 90% of the Earth's landmass is underwater and there's no fossil fuel energy, how the hell are we creating new innovative technology that's capable of replacing bees? Because right now, scientists have discussed that issue. We've determined we can't do it. We've determined, technologically speaking, replacing bees on a mass scale is impossible for us at this moment. We need the bees. And the idea that we created the technology to replace them during a world war, during a period where the ice caps were melting, with no energy, that explanation doesn't hold water. See what I did there? A follow-up to that point is we also have all kinds of other innovations in technology that are discussed throughout this book, including absolutely insane weapons technology that is centuries ahead of what we have now not 60 years centuries if it's even possible within the laws of physics to have weapons that do the kind of stuff that some of these weapons are described as being capable of doing and again we researched and developed this technology with no power with no commercial grade availability of modern power do you know anything mr ross about how commercial production of these things works do you have any idea how much energy these things take commercial production of new technology is insanely energy expensive that's why only first world countries produce new technology you do not set up a world where all commercial energy is gone and then tell me there's a bunch of new technology. It's one or the other. Pick. 3.12. The Dark Elf Invasion at the end of this book, which is supposed to be like this big event, the Dark Elves are set up as being this hugely dangerous foe, an ancestral enemy to the Elves of Lanakia. They've invaded once before. They mutated with a curse. One of the uh queen's advisors into a hideous deformed state their setup is being dangerous and wicked and very much not nice yes and they're repelled with a threat none of their soldiers die their head guy doesn't die they're repelled with a threat from a human with human technology that frankly their magic would negate their magic makes this technology look pathetic. But the Dark Elves run scared from it. You can't set up this big bad villain that's supposedly, you know, a, a serious military threat and have them run scared from a piece of technology that you could literally swat out of the air like a fly. It's this, it's this little bullet that supposedly can fly around like a drone it's programmable, can lock onto a DNA signature, all kinds of fancy stuff. But it's still a physical device. And these elves are described as being able to command weather with their magic. If you can command weather, you can create a little bit of kinetic force to smush a machine. Or hell, a force field. <sighs> there's, there's absolutely no logic. No logic applied at all. Oh, God. Finally, on past the subpoints of number three, we arrive at point four. This book is a textbook example of why we show and do not tell. When I tell you that he stops mid story to give three pages of explanation, exposition, routinely, that's not an exaggeration. I counted. Three pages of exposition, routinely. I've had editors and manuscript critiquers tell me that my one or two paragraphs of exposition was unacceptable. 
when there was something right down the line a couple pages later that it was relevant to. The exposition was for something that came in the same chapter. He gives three pages of exposition for things that never show up in the story at all. Period. Never show up. Three pages of exposition explaining this thing. We never see it. Why? Moving on to point five. The dialogue. Oh, sweet God have mercy. The dialogue. What is perhaps, maybe, definitely, I don't know, you decide, the worst thing about this book is the dialogue. It sounds like robots talking to each other, or two extremely awkward people talking to each other. It's clunky, and robotic, and emotionless, and it makes no sense. On the case of the elves, you could say, well, it's the elves and that their culture and how they speak. Okay, I could buy that if the humans spoke normally, but they all speak the same. There's the dialogue's terrible equally on both sides. There's that website that you can go to and talk to an AI, and it actually does a better job of imitating human life than the dialogue in this book does. That's not an exaggeration. I've gone and talked to that AI. It's actually a little scary. <laughs> Sometimes it can get really penetrating. A sub point of this is that part of the reason the dialogue is so bad is that the author seems to think character dialogue is the perfect time to deliver exposition. He treats character dialogue as this grand opportunity to explain his world. The elves routinely lecture humans about things about their world that the humans never asked about. They just go off on these long explanations, and it has no relevance to the story, and it's boring. I'm sorry, Mr. Ross, but your story is not so fascinating, and your world so new and unique that we need to hear about every little facet of it in detail. We don't want a bunch of exposition for the biosphere of your world. Sorry, bud. Point number six no sense of humanity in this book at all when you're writing with characters that are human or really any characters that you want to be well received and liked they need to have a sense of humanity even if they're a different species they have to feel alive they have to feel like they have a soul if they're sentient beings they need to have a personality and respond to things in a reasonable, logical way. When something bad happens, we have an emotional response. When something good happens, we have a positive response. When I tell you that these characters never react appropriately to anything, that's not an exaggeration. Here's a bit of writing from the book to, to give you an example. Verbatim. What a day, he thought. Life throws us these curveballs, and sometimes we wonder how we will survive. Verbatim. You might think that that's the protagonist thinking to himself after a particularly hard day of work where many challenges came up and he had to figure out how to get around them. Or perhaps... Perhaps uh, his car broke down and he's stranded in the middle of nowhere and he doesn't know how he's going to get out of the situation. No. He just witnessed his brother shot to death by his father and he's now on trial for the murder. And those are his thoughts. Mr. Ross, do you understand how people think? Do you understand emotion? Do you have a sense of empathy? Point number seven. And this is moving away from style and technique and that kind of stuff and moving into ethics. There's straight up plagiarism in this book. If you've seen the movie Lord of War, then you're familiar with the AK-47 speech. It is Nicolas Cage's best bit of dialogue in that movie. It's an iconic bit of cinema, 
as an actor, I can tell you a lot of actors use that speech when they do auditions because you can play with it and deliver it so many different ways and it's well recognized and it's fun to do. The AK-47 speech from Lord of War is iconic. Michael Ross straight up rips it off. He has a character quote it, damn near word for word, and the character doesn't say anything about it being from a movie. There's nothing in the acknowledgments or the credits of the book where he acknowledges that he borrowed the speech from Lord of War. And it would be one thing if it was a snippet of the speech or if the character acknowledged that he was quoting that speech. But it really feels like, because the character just quotes the speech, he just says it, and then moves on with the rest of the conversation, it really feels like Michael was trying to pass that off as his original writing. You can reference pop culture in your book. Harry Dresden quotes lines from movies and comics and references pop culture all the time. It's one of the reasons he's the lovable scamp that he is. I would never accuse Jim Butcher of plagiarism because he nods to the to the work of other people. He doesn't blatantly rip it off. I'm sorry man, when you quote an entire speech and don't and don't have the character say at the end, heard that in movie once. Very true. That's all it would take. And by the way, that's how that character talks, which is part of the next point. When you can't even be bothered to have the character say something like that to let us all know that you're not plagiarizing, it feels to me like you're plagiarizing, and I don't respect it. And point number seven, perhaps the most severe criticism of all in some people's mind, not mine, because this is not the kind of thing I normally care about. I want to preface this point by saying... I am not a social justice warrior. I am not someone who is hypersensitive about all these issues in our modern day society. I think far too many people are thin skinned and emotionally and mentally weak. And I think we all need to toughen up as a society and the world be, would be better for it. That being said, racism exists. Sexism exists. These problems do exist. There is an incredibly racist depiction of a Chinese man in this book. And again, I don't think that Michael Ross should be cancelled. I don't think that he should have his uh, information doxxed or have anything bad happen to him. I am informing you, Mr. Ross, that you might want to rethink how you depict ethnic minorities in your stories because Ding Ling, the Chinese servant of the protagonist, is a walking racist stereotype of Chinese immigrants. And I know if I was Chinese, I would be so offended, I wouldn't even have words for the level of offense. And frankly, it has no place in modern literature. Or, frankly, a polite society. And I want to be very clear racism's only place in literature is to be derided and severely mocked and critiqued if you're going to depict racists if you're going to have a racist depiction in your book it had better be to highlight the absurdity and evils of racism not to make light of a character's ethnic heritage and use him as comic relief so guys that is pretty much everything I have to say about this book. I really debated whether or not I wanted to make this video at all because I do not want my channel to be about picking on people and I do not want my channel to be about drama between indie authors and I don't want to have the cat call channel on the, you know, I don't, that's not what I want my channel to be about. But my god, when you send me a book to review and it is just so full of errors that frankly, never showed up in my rough draft of my novel, frankly, have no place in a published, polished work that's supposedly been through an editor's hands, what am I to do? I can't not talk about it. You sent me your book for a review? We gotta talk about it. And the final point I would like to make here is perhaps the most poignant point I have to make the most relevant, 
more relevant than anything else I've had to say. The author had a chance to come and defend his work. He had a chance to come and answer questions. He didn't even ask what my criticisms were. He didn't even ask what the critiques were. He just elected to skip the interview. If you don't believe in your work enough to come defend it in the face of criticism, in the face of critique, and answer some hard questions about why you did things the way you did, why things turned out the way they did, do you really believe in your work? Do you really take pride in your work? Are you serious about what you're doing? When people criticize my book, I look at it very seriously and I measure the criticism based on who it's coming from and the merit of the criticism and I say, is this a valuable criticism or is it something that is a more matter of the reader's personal biases and opinions and I very seriously decide whether to act on the criticism. Acting on criticism is an important part of being a good writer. It's an important part of being good at any profession. If you cannot take criticism and critique of your work, it is a sign that you are not serious about your work, in my humble opinion. The author had a chance to come on and defend his novel. He did not. And that says more about the novel than I ever could. So, leaving you with that cheery note, I wish you all a good day, happy day after Halloween. Uh, stay safe out there. I'll catch you guys next time.